Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is John Thrasher, Assistant Professor in the Philosophy Department and in the Smith Institute for Political Economy and Philosophy at Chapman University. His new book, co-authored with Daniel Halliday, is The Ethics of Capitalism, an Introduction. Welcome to Free Thoughts, John. Oh, thanks for having me. So your your book is a textbook uh, of sorts, uh, maybe a little bit, definitely more readable than your average textbook, but it's a textbook. What was the intended audience and, and purpose of the book? Well, the intended audience started out as as undergraduates and is still primarily focused on undergraduates, although we think other people will probably get something out of reading it. But the book kind of came about from teaching some classes in this general area and just noticing that basically everyone seemed to hate capitalism for some reason or another. Uh, this seemed to be true on the left and the right. And in the book, we talk about this, that if you just, when we first started writing that, we we entered in on Google um, for an auto-completion, you know, capitalism is, and we got up all kinds of lists of things like bad, evil, the root of all evils, you know, slavery, that kind of thing. And so it just kind of puzzled us why, why everyone hated capitalism and then what it is that they exactly hated. Was it capitalism exactly, or was it the status quo, or was it in other kinds of injustice that they were equating with capitalism? And this led us to to want to ask more kind of detailed and involved questions about capitalism, its ethics, and uh, people's responses to it. This dislike of capitalism certainly seems to have been a long time feature on the left, and you know we're seeing a lot more of it on the right with the especially like national conservatism and the populist movement there. But is this really a new thing? Like, do people dislike capitalism or whatever they imagine capitalism to be more than they used to? It's hard to say. I mean, I can say from our experience writing the book, when we started writing the book, um, people didn't like capitalism, but it was nowhere near as widespread as it got when we basically were finishing the book and, and um, after we published it. Um, and some of that had to do, I think, with uh, the rise of kind of the nationalist right. So you were kind of getting it from both sides. Um, but it does seem to be more mainstream than before. So when you have outlets, you know, as diverse as Teen Vogue and the Claremont Review of Books, both attacking capitalism, uh, you know that something something is going on. Um, we also started to notice a bunch of other works on capitalism books. So uh, Tama Piketty's book, for instance, on capital in the 21st century is very popular. Uh, Anthony Lowenstein, uh, Naomi Klein, um, Shoshana Zoboff, uh, Orrin Cass on the right. A lot of people were coming out with books. And what we noticed about them was they all had a kind of, there was a modifier to capitalism. So in Piketty's book, he talks about patrimonial capitalism. Lowenstein talks about disaster capitalism. Klein talks about, you know, the shock doctrine and disaster capitalism or surveillance capitalism with Zuboff or, or these kind of things. And what we started thinking is, well, maybe it's just that first modifier that people don't like. It's the surveillance or it's the, you know, the patrimonial aspect or it's the disaster part or whatever. Is it really capitalism that people are objecting to? Um, so then we started kind of digging into that. But you're right that people have been hating capitalism since the beginning, in a sense. And so one of the questions we wanted to ask when we were writing the book was, why did people think that capitalism was a good idea to begin with? Like at some point, people were at, like Adam Smith, the early political economists were advocating for capitalism. And of course, there was this great kind of explosion in the early you know, or mid 18th century on um, that, that we call capitalism. So why did people think it was a good idea at the time if indeed they did? And what would those people think today if they were looking at our society? It seems like some of these people and some of the critics you mentioned, um, they describe a lot of things as capitalism. I once heard someone, it might've been Naomi Klein, but don't quote me on that, but someone along those lines described the drug war as capitalism, which struck me as very interesting. Um, but you do hear a lot of things like this where the word is used to invoke almost all wrongs that are in the world today. Um, but so did you, to sort of counter that tendency, did you guys try to define it in a, in a more, you know, just at least, so at least some things are not capitalism, such as the drug war, and we can like at least get some idea of what this might be? Yeah. And so this, this really was something that was striking to us, both talking to students and, you know, reading things in the media that just basically anything that people didn't like seem to be identified with capitalism. And and we thought, well, you know, some of those things are probably related to capitalism, but some of them certainly aren't. Like when you hear, you know, racism and capitalism combined, 
well, racism has existed, you know, for all of human history, as far as we know, or slavery has existed, or, you know, sexism or whatever, right? So those can't be caused by capitalism. Now, maybe there's aspects of capitalism that make them worse, or, or perhaps even better, but they can't be the same thing, right? And so we wanted to, so as you point out, we had to de- figure out, well, can we come up with some kind of analysis or, or definition or, or specification of capitalism that allows us to kind of isolate it and think about what characteristics it has that are unique to it? Uh, and then what aspects of the status quo that people don't like um, are they pointing to and claiming that that's capitalism? And so that's actually a big part of the first chapter of the book is trying to do that. And uh, there's there's a lot of pitfalls along that way. And and one of the things that we come up with in the book is the idea that, you know, I think typically these discussions go is that we don't like something, that thing is capitalism, let's reject it in favor of what? I don't know, usually socialism, let's say. But we want to say, well, no, there's there's kind of a before capitalism and there's an after capitalism, if you want to think of it in time scale. Or we like to think of it as a kind of spatial analogy. We have a triangle in the book. Um, you know, where we have feudalism, which is kind of hierarchical societies, and socialism, which is kind of non-capitalist societies. And then we think about what are the aspects of each. And then we say, well, look, you could identify any moment in the status quo or a moment in time in a different society as being kind of some space in this triangle. It might be closer in some respects to, you know, feudalism or socialism. So then we say there's things in that you might not like about the world around you, but it's just an open question whether those are distinctive of capitalism or not. They might be vestiges of feudalism that are still around, uh, or they might be aspects of socialism or some combination. And so to really figure out what it is that you don't like, what the ethical problems that you're pointing to are, you really need to get clear on what are the distinctive characteristics of capitalism. Is there a difference between capitalism and free markets? Um, like so a, a couple of months ago, we had on a guest, uh, Corey Massimino, who calls himself a free market anti-capitalist anarchist. And so is there – is that an incoherent idea or is there a meaningful distinction? I think that there has to be a distinction in principle between markets and capitalism. So – and this is why – Now, so the the later question about free markets and anarchism is a slightly different one, but I'll just start with the first, which is that we think that markets have more or less always existed to one degree or another and will exist in basically any institutional framework. So you have markets in prisons, uh, you have markets in illegal goods, um, you know, you have markets in um, drugs or whatever it might be. You had markets in ancient Rome. Right. But a lot of these, I would not say that any of those are distinctively capitalistic in any fundamental sense. So then we ask, well, what is it? What is distinctive of capitalism? So our thinking is that capitalism is the institutional framework around markets that kind of, in some ways, to preserve the openness or functioning of markets. Um, Now, that's all very normatively loaded. And so we get pretty specific about what we mean by that. But I would just say that. Markets in capitalism are never completely free because there's these institutional structures that define uh, various kinds of behavior in the market, what acceptable contracts are, what kinds of things count as property, um, you know, how how much trade and with whom you're able to do. And so we say in capitalist societies, those tend to be kind of those parameters tend to be uh, turned in particular directions, whereas in socialist societies or kind of feudalist non-capitalist societies, they tend to be turned in other directions. Um, I understand the the the, um, the aversion to the term on some level, because, you know, as we know in the book, capitalism is a kind of. I wouldn't say it's exactly a pejorative, but it was coined by the opponents of capitalism kind of early on. And so it's not exactly probably a name that you would choose for the system that you're that you're trying to defend. But on the other hand, I just can't think of a better word for it. Um, It's just kind of broad institutional framework uh, of the sort that we see in developed and open societies. Uh, That's how I would I have more specific kind of parameters of what that amounts to. But that was the basic notion um, that we we kind of started with. And then so we started looking, well, what what features did these types of societies share? And then thinking about, you know, well, what's essential about that and what's not? And then we kind of tried to to zero in on what we thought um, capitalism amounted to. Well, as you point out in the book, the, and you mentioned previously, the 
the early days of capitalism before it even had a name featured various thinkers, Adam Smith probably being the most prominent, John Stuart Mill a little bit later, the people like Adam Ferguson too, who who viewed the endeavor of sort of looking at these governing systems and economics, well, that, although that term itself was a little bit new, they viewed it as sort of a holistic thing encompassing a bunch of different things, political philosophy, regular uh, normal philosophy, economics, and created a justification for capitalism that was a little bit more, I would say, rich than maybe after the 20th century when things get segmented out. Um, is that is that a sort of tradition that you were trying to resuscitate maybe, or at least like work within to try and bring something back that maybe is a way of talking about capitalism that students today haven't really heard too much? Yeah, that's exactly right. So that was definitely one of our aims. I mean, we look back at the, the early uh, defenders, but also in some ways um, like creators of what we think of as capitalism, um, especially Adam Smith, but David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, a lot of people you mentioned. We talk about these people as we thought of this as the kind of golden age of political economy. And what we mean by that is, as exactly as you were saying, is not these people weren't just economists. And in fact, the idea of an economist wasn't quite around at that time. They, you know, Adam Smith was primarily a moral philosopher, you know, or we might even say like partly a political philosopher. Uh, earlier versions of that, David Hume, one of his friends, was also, you know, a philosopher. Um, John Stuart Mill, certainly a very important philosopher. So these early political economists were certainly concerned about uh, ethics. They were concerned about political theory. They were concerned about uh, what we would probably today call political science and then kind of economics, business, those kind of things. And so it was a very holistic kind of approach. And uh, so we talk about that in the book is we call it political economy. But what we really just mean is um, – you know, an, an approach to economics that also takes seriously a lot of these other questions uh, in terms of ethics and, and politics. And so today we would probably think of this as uh, a PPE or a philosophy, politics and economics type approach, um, which I'm very much in that kind of mold. And, and I know that my co-author is as well. And so we're kind of interested in that uh, fusion and thinking about how the benefits that you can get from looking at, you know, economic questions with, you know, a moral lens and political lens. And we're thinking that it's pretty hard to to address a lot of these questions profitably without kind of triangulating in all those different ways. And so we try to do that as much as we can in the book. Um, and we look back at the history of political economy and type, look at the kinds of questions that these early political economists were, were kind of asking and answering to try to see why capitalism seems so appealing and especially appealing and compared to what? And, you know, we say, well, looking back to the society before um, or the time the society that was kind of they were moving away from, which we characterize as a kind of feudal society. But really, it's just a hierarchical, not very open society, kind of the last gasp of these closed societies in Europe. And they're, they're arguing against that from from a lot of different angles. If you talk to a, a probably a pretty typical college student today, and it's so far as they know about Adam Smith as maybe quote unquote the founder of capitalism, it would they would they might conclude that Adam Smith and maybe even John Stuart Mill, but probably definitely Adam Smith was a reactionary, profit driven, uh, kind of business friendly guy. Um, you know, kind of into the creeping into the fascist realm, which is of course how capitalism is often described. That doesn't seem to be an accurate depiction of what Adam Smith was actually doing. No, I, Adam Smith is a kind of a great revolutionary thinker at his time, I would say. Uh, and that's not just in terms of political economy, but also his thoughts on politics. And I would also say on, on um, morality and philosophy generally. So his great friend at the time was David Hume. You know, he's one of the more kind of revolutionary thinkers of all time, I would say. And uh, my interpretation of Smith is that he kind of follows along in, in Hume's footsteps in a lot of ways. And you can say the same thing about John Stuart Mill. Now, Mill was a um, political uh, reformer. Uh, he, he's a complicated figure. Uh, you know, he was on the board of the East India Company for a long time and uh, a manager there, but he was also a reformer in favor of women's rights and contraceptives. And so he's he's kind of all over the place, as a lot of these guys are. And, and part of the reason is because their world is changing pretty rapidly. Things are changing and they're trying to make sense of them and they're trying to come up with ways to think through this new world that is starting that, you know, they're kind of in the birth pangs of in a sense. And, and Smith probably does this better than anyone else. And the wealth of nations, I think, could profitably be read as a kind of blueprint for that world. And, you know, it's probably no surprise that Adam Smith, unlike virtually all of his contemporaries, 
You know, he's he's got what we would consider the right answers on things like slavery, imperialism, colonialism, on the American Revolution, even. Um, so the reason for that, I think, though, is that he he has a frame of mind that's that he's he's looking at things in a way that we would, I think, find more congenial than a lot of others. Now, contrast that to <clears throat> to the kind of the hero of the anti-capitalist, which I would say maybe you could pick two, but certainly Marx, probably Rousseau as well. And these are actual reactionaries. I mean, these are people who are reacting against the world that they see emerging around them and trying to kind of either go back to some kind of um, some kind of uh, Edenic past in the in this in Rousseau sense or uh, towards a kind of post-millenarian future uh, and, and in Marx's sense. And so I basically think that like part of the reason why we focus in the book on a lot of these characters, which we do, so we, we follow uh, a lot of the thoughts of people like Smith and Mill and, and, and even Marx a little bit throughout the book is to kind of show their train of thought and what they're responding to. And um, students tend to, I think, be surprised when they, part of the thing when we're teaching this book and, and on the website, um, ethicsofcapitalism.com, we have a model syllabus that uh, people can can use to if they want to teach the book. And on that, there's also a lot of uh, primary sources that we teach with the book. So John Stuart Mill and, and Smith. And when students read those, they're often, I think, surprised at how how different these people turn out to be than what their what their kind of cartoonish image of them is. And we try to quote them a lot in the book, although there's, you know, kind of limits to that. We also found, however, when we were teaching, and one of the reasons why we wrote the book is just that students have a little trouble with some of the primary texts because they're written, you know, in the 18th century or 19th century. Uh, and so sometimes it's important to kind of give them some context for that. And part of that is is trying to give them the political and economic context that a lot of these these writers are working in. You quote Elizabeth Anderson, who's been a guest on Free Thoughts a couple times, and her quote that said, free markets used to be a cause of the left, which is an interesting quote, but also kind of maybe is a little bit difficult because it plays into this left-right distinction, uh, which doesn't seem to make much sense. But at least insofar as we're saying that there was a time when champions of free markets were radical social reformers looking to make the world more egalitarian, I guess, in the way that you described, yeah. Exactly. And then, I mean, that's one of the things that we wanted to highlight in the book. Uh, I totally agree with you that thinking in terms of left and right is extraordinarily confusing and I think misleading. And I even like lapsed into it earlier when I was thinking in terms of one dimension of time. And that's precisely why when we're thinking, when we were thinking about capitalism and socialism, we wanted to, to think about it in a kind of two dimensional, you know, triangular plane, if that makes sense, to think about it in, in slightly different ways. And, um, but the point to note is just that the people who cared about capitalism at the outset also cared about what we would consider today things like egalitarianism, uh, sometimes justice, but certainly making people's lives better, giving them more opportunities to live different kinds of lives, uh, expanding their um, expanding what kinds of relationships that they could have or what you know they could think about their their children doing, and so I think it's it's strange today to to for people to kind of miss that aspect of it. And so that was one thing that we wanted, we wanted to highlight, but also, you know, we wanted to, again, bring some of these characters back and think about well, what of their concerns are still live issues today. You know, what are things that they would still have questions about um, d despite the kind of um, the changes that have happened. Is there a tension between those things, between capitalism and the pursuit of the various other values that you mentioned, like justice, such that you are eventually going to get a coming apart, a tearing apart there. I'm Because I'm thinking of one of the common objections you hear about a capitalistic system is that it's almost in a sense fundamentally anti-ethical, that, that ethics is about you know figuring out what the right values are in your life and in the world and the actions we can take to pursue those. But capitalism necessarily by its very nature reduces value to profits, to what you can buy and sell and for how much. You know, like Milton Friedman say, you know, a, a corporation's only responsibility is to maximize profits for its shareholders and kind of all these other things, justice and compassion and respect and the good of people be damned is the way that that gets interpreted. 
is that a fundamental tension? Like how can you in a in a system that measures everything based on how much it costs in the market and how much profit you can make by selling it, how can you have space for those other values? I sometimes we, we sometimes get asked questions, uh, not quite this question, but along these lines, are they talking about something like the logic of capitalism or or you know the uh, this kind of thing that the capitalism kind of demands a certain kind of result or that it measures things along one one type of value, let's say money, which is um, in the background there as well. And I would just say that um, that's certainly a possibility within a capitalist system. But what capitalism does, uh, from my point of view, is it creates a lot of possibilities for value that then people can then choose to uh, pursue or then commensurate in various ways in the market and outside of the market. So uh, there's no law of capitalism that says one must kind of advance the profit in the most narrow way possible or something like that. That's a conversation we can have about what the role for businesses should be in a capitalist society. So that's exactly what Milton Friedman was doing when he was making that case, right? And others have responded to that case since then. And so one of the things that we wanted to point out in the book, and I think in some ways the, the great um, purpose of the book is to is to raise this point and say that there's a lot of ethical questions that you can have within a capitalist society that are not answered by capitalism itself, by existence of capitalism. So in some ways, that's to, to kind of push back and say that capitalism is a pretty diverse thing. It's a pretty diverse set of institutional structures that all have certain characteristics, but that there's a lot of different ways of doing them. And within that, there's a lot of different ways to, to live your lives and to behave, live your life and behave. And so, you know, oftentimes if you have a class on capitalism of the, of the sort that like Dan or I might have been asked to teach, um, you know, on capitalism or something like that, or socialism or justice and economics, it might just be a class about capitalism versus socialism, right? Like what's the ethically more acceptable system? And we really didn't like that kind of, and so you might read something like Nozick or Jason Brennan on the one hand, and then like Jerry Cohen on the other hand, right? Rejecting capitalism and say, well, here's these two kind of ideal systems. Which one do we like? And we really wanted to reject that approach because we wanted to say that within a capitalist society. So, so basically, the point is to say there that um, the ethical question is about whether you want ethics or whether you want capitalism, right? So, capitalism does all these great things, but it can't be an ethical. It, it can't be there can't be interesting ethical questions asked within capitalism, right? It's about uh, efficiency or welfare or something like that. And then on the other side, you have socialism, which has all these drawbacks. Um, but it might it might give you the ethical advantages that you want. And we want to say, it seems within a capital system, there's a ton of ethical questions that you can still ask profitably without rejecting capitalism, right? And so that's that's kind of where we're coming from. And that that question about businesses and the role of businesses and the ethical responsibility of businesses and, and those types of questions about consumption or about whatever it might be, to me, those are ethical questions um, that don't, you know, answering them one way doesn't, make you into a socialist or turn you into an anti-capitalist. It seems like there's a lot of different ways of conceiving about how different kinds of businesses should um, should work within a capitalist society. Now, this, this may be preempting a later question that you have, but, you know, because of the way that we think about capitalism um, it, as this kind of uh, institutional structure that has a bunch of different characteristics, uh, every capitalist society is going to exist within a democratic society for the most part. Um, and so politics and economics are not going to be separate and they need to be kind of intertwined in various ways. And so in a democratic society, these are the kinds of questions that we're always in some sense negotiating with one another as we go along. So capitalism doesn't answer all of those questions. Um, they have to be answered by people thinking through um, ethical questions individually, but also uh, questions that we, we think about democratically too. Yeah, you, we were talking about socialism and capitalism, but you brought up feudalism a couple of times as one of the points on your triangle. It's interesting that I, it struck me when you I said, okay, feudalism, that seems quite long gone. Uh, I'm picturing like the constitutional peasant and Monty Python or something. It's been a, quite a while since we've had a feudalistic society. How How is that a like a relevant point on the triangle uh, that you're kind of describing between capitalism, socialism, and feudalism? Well, we thought it was um, an important point in logical space, but also one that you do see around you in various aspects. So 
Um, we think of feudalism as char characterized primarily by uh, societies uh, that they're that have status hierarchies, where there might be some private ownership, um, and there's not full public ownership of of everything, but that it's not very widespread, and the people who who do have the ownership of goods and oftentimes services, they also have other kinds of privileges, usually in terms of power, being able to kind of uh, order people around. People have different statuses in those societies that allow them uh, different privileges with respect to what they can do, the kind of jobs they can have, that kind of thing. And, and also that the economy tends to be pretty, the economy and the political system tends to be pretty closed. And, and planned in various ways. Um, so either a small group of elites or, or um, you know, something like that that's running the show. So we thought that that was important, partly because that's a pro we think that's a much better characterization of a lot of the societies that existed before capitalism came along, say in Europe, but also a good characterization of a lot of societies that still exist that don't seem to be obviously, you know, socialist in the way that we might think about it, but that are also uh, not capitalist in the sense uh, that we describe it. And so one of the things that we noticed, and again, this was also influenced by Elizabeth Anderson's work, was just thinking, you know, what aspects of that people point to as being maybe unjust or unethical or just bad in some other way uh, in our current system might actually be vestiges of kind of feudal society um, that still kind of exists, that, you know, capitalism in some sense never overturned, or maybe these are kind of neo-feudal um, revivals in some in some ways or something like that. And of course, we use feudal kind of advisedly, like it does kind of sound like a Monty Python or a, a Game of Thrones type of situation, but, um, but we're really just thinking of kind of uh, hierarchical closed societies, uh, you know, probably what North Wallace and one guess would call, you know, um, uh, natural states or, or something like that or extractive 